very much. <laughs> so good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a great pleasure to see the so many young people from all over the world interested in general relativity. Uh, so as uh, Lorenzo told you, I'm from Vienna now, but I'm originally from Poland. I have a name which is very difficult to pronounce. If you want to do it right, it's Hruschel. Try. He was almost, uh, almost there. Uh, since my uh, predecessor started a uh, uh, limb uh, breaking uh, uh, information, I'm going to join in. And uh, uh, so uh, I don't have any uh, sportive uh, um, achievements, but I like a lot of skiing, and uh, that uh, cost me several broken legs. So uh, <laughs> compared to his fingers. Uh, uh, Good. So, um, and as you have noticed, I'm from University of Vienna. I mean, if you haven't, then you can read it here. And we're very proud to be the second uh, German-speaking university uh, ever. The first one was uh, in Prague, and uh, uh, and, and it's uh, in the region the third oldest one. So that's been actually 654 years now. Good. So. Uh, I'm going to uh, tell you today uh, a little bit about uh, mass in asymptotically flat space times. So uh, if uh, my, my, yeah, again, my colleague said that he's uh, Handwriting of the blackboard is challenging. Well, you haven't seen mine. So I still have some students recovering from my lectures in Vienna. But so please don't uh, uh, hesitate to interrupt uh, and uh, ask questions, because that's what we are in for, uh, here for. And so let me start with uh, uh, the first question, why uh, mass or energy? Uh, these things go together, and uh, I must admit I will not be very consistent. I will uh, often mix, use the two names for the same thing, things which are not quite the same. So uh, in any case, uh, uh, that's my first question. I'm probably going to avoid this dark spot here. Uh, so uh, how does it work? Well. Uh, if you look at classical mechanics, uh, this is a very useful thing to have. And uh, in one dimension, uh, then, uh, well, if you have your conserved energy, which has the usual uh, form with the potential, uh, you know that this thing is conserved. Uh, and so you draw your potential. So say the potential looks like that. Uh, you know everything about the orbit. Right? You know everything about how the system behaves. So for example, if you are at this energy level, so this is your energy one, then uh, you know that you have that much kinetic energy here. So you have as much mx dot square as this thing allows. So obviously, if you are at this point in x, and this is... Uh, V, then uh, you must be moving, right? Because this measures how much you have this. So either you're going to this way or this way. So, well, you keep moving until you can't anymore, because here you know that you have zero velocity, right? And so uh, at this energy level, you know that the orbit will just do this, and in a periodic way, uh, just by uniqueness of. Uh, solutions of ideas. And if you are at this energy level here, then you know, well, they have that much energy. Uh, well, you have much more energy than need, right? So you have, well, you have that much energy here. So you still have velocity here. And you are here. You still have velocity. So either you'll be going this way, and you'll be going forever, because <laughs> this can never get 0. Or you'll go here, and you'll have to bounce back and, and go back, right? So this is uh, 
extremely useful uh, if you just don't need the exact form of the solution, but just want to know what the solutions do, then, then you're done here, right? Well, in higher dimensions, it's somewhat similar. So if, uh, so, so I'm not just going to say anything, but in a radial potential uh, in 3D, uh, you have the same picture, uh, 3D, then uh, you go to a, uh, you just uh, take the radial part of the motion, well, you can analyze uh, similarly, similar analysis for analysis for R dot. And uh, in fact, this potential here is what you will get if you are in a, I hope, uh, this should be a, a Newtonian potential with angular momentum, right? So you have an angular momentum barrier here and this is going to, well, not quite to zero, but this doesn't matter. Anyway, so, so that's also useful. Well, what about uh, field theory? So let's say scalar field. Uh, so you look at this equation, box phi is equal m square phi. And uh, well, as long as I haven't told you what is my signature, the sign here doesn't really matter because I can always change the metric to minus the metric to get this sign. But I'm thinking about a sign which uh, gives you an energy which looks like integral of R3 of uh, say one half d phi over dt square plus space gradient squared plus m square phi square. So this thing is constant in time because of this equation. So uh, one implies that d over dt is zero. Well, actually, if you are a mathematician, you should, st should stop, start wondering whether this is finite to start with and whether you can differentiate it uh, uh, to get d over dt. There is a theorem which says that in uh, physics, every integral is differentiable. So, uh, so you can certainly do this. Uh, so the fact that this is conserved is telling you that these things, each of these terms remains finite. So nothing can go bad with your field. And in fact, you can use the fact that this is conserved to prove global existence of solutions. Uh, in this simple case, it's a linear problem, so proving global existence is not an issue. But uh, if you do this for a young Mills fields, uh, which I'm going just to mention for those who know what they are, then uh, if you don't, that doesn't really matter. You can just do something like that, E squared plus B squared. So it's like the Maxwell field, but not necessarily abelian. So in a Maxwell, uh, of course, there's a clash of notation here. This is the electric field. This is Maxwell field. But maybe so I just do this like that. So again, this is for, for Maxwell or Young Mills. Uh, this is conserved by the same theorem <laughs> as before. And, uh, and in fact, for linear theory, there is no really uh, no difficulties to prove a global existence. But if you take Young Mills equations, the statement that you have global existence of solutions of the Young Mills equations is a non trivial one. And there is a uh, extremely difficult theorem of Kleinerman and Macedon, which, based on the conservation of this, proves global existence of solution of the Young Mills equations in Minkowski space time. Okay, so I'm not going to write this down because it's just kind of a parenthesis of what I'm doing. But so energies are useful for PDs. Uh, actually, what one needs another parenthesis, it's enough to have. Uh, not conservation, but something like dE over dt is smaller than a constant time e, and uh, e positive to prove theorems for uh, existence of solutions of partial differential equations. So, so notions of energy are useful for both from a physical point of view and from a mathematical point of view. 
Now, uh, there's a problem in GR, uh, which is as follows. Uh, so, if you have a Lagrangian field theory uh, where you have uh, any kind of collections of fields, then there is an energy associated with this, which I'm going to come back to later, which is essentially some kind of expression in uh, phi and d phi. Okay, so that's uh, a general rule. Uh, I'm going to review this in my lecture three. So, uh, Lagrangian field theory, you can calculate an object called the energy. And uh, what is important that not only you have a total energy, but you have an energy density, right? So for the scalar field, your energy density would be this integrand here. For Maxwell fields or for Young Mills, this would be your integrand here. And uh, the usual argument that in general relativity this cannot work is that, well, if you think as phi to be the metric, then its derivative would be partial derivatives of the metric. By the way, I'll come back to my notation a little uh, later, but so this d sigma is the same as dg mu nu over dx sigma. And uh, there is a standard theorem uh, in uh, differential geometry which says that suppose you have a manifold, choose a point, you can find coordinates so that this matrix has at this point constant entries and at this point the derivatives of the metric will be zero. Right. So in uh, physics it's called uh, local inertial coordinates, in uh, mathematics it's called normal coordinates. So at every point you can make G to take a standard form. If you're Lorentzian, it's going to be minus one plus plus plus. If you're Riemannian, it's going to be all pluses, plus ones. And the derivatives will be zero, right? But then this expression at this point will be zero. And so uh, conclusion that people draw out of this is that there is no local uh, expression for the uh, energy of the uh, gravitational field. So there is no geometric object which you can integrate. And therefore, but if there isn't one which you can integrate like that, then maybe there is a problem with uh, doing this in general relativity as well. And uh, uh, well, I, I would think that, I would say that this is the kind of conclusion, well, I don't know how to do some things that I'm trying to, I'm going to find an excuse to say you cannot do this, right? So that's what physicists have been telling us for years, and maybe that's correct. Maybe there is no way to find a good notion of energy density of general relativity. Maybe there is one that people haven't found yet, right? So uh, this argument only tells you that you cannot find one like that, which will have a geometric character as a density at a point. But, uh, well, you know, you have a career ahead of you. I think if somebody here finds a nice candidate for this, that uh, would be a good PhD project. Uh, but, uh, well, let me also uh, mention that uh, whatever you do, uh, you discover this thing, you think it has to be the energy. Uh, well, it has to be useful to something, right? So. Uh, there are things like uh, Bell-Robinson tensor or things like that. You could take the square of this and say, well, this is the energy. Uh, uh, you have to be careful with definition. A definition is good for something if you can prove something with it, right? If it's useful for something, then good, right? That's worth proving. If you just have a definition and you spend half your life saying this is the right notion, but you can't do anything with it, then that's not a good career uh, 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 idea. So in any case, in GR, there's no universally accepted notion of energy density. Now it turns out that there is one uh, uh, global uh, 
for asymptotically flat space time, so that's what I'm going to uh, discuss in, uh, uh, well, maybe most of these lectures, but at least certainly today. Uh, so there is something called the uh, uh, global energy. So there is no well-defined expression like this, but there is a well-defined integral. Okay? So there is a well-defined integral. Uh, before I uh, uh, discuss this, so this would be the ADM mass or ADM energy momentum. This would be a global integral rather than a local object. Uh, still, the question arises, what, what is it good for, right? So you define something. Uh, can you do something clever, interesting with it? So to my knowledge, the most interesting story behind this and, uh, uh, is the positive energy theorems. Uh, which are interesting in their own uh, but but so what right so what so something is positive five five is a very nice positive number so five is the energy of the gravitational field I have a positive energy theorem uh, without much work uh, so theorems are interesting if you can do something with them that's what I said before, and the positive energy CRM or CRMs have two applications. First, first, solution of the Yamabe problem, and I'm going to maybe tell you more about this later, so uh, at the moment, if you don't know what this is, then uh, we'll come back to this later. So there's a Difficult partial differential equation problems, geometric, which has been solved using the positive energy theorem in general relativity. So this sounds like a good enough reason to present those. Uh, and uh, another application is uniqueness of static black holes. So again, you use the positive energy theorem to prove that uh, under center conditions, uh, well, unique static vacuum black holes is Schwarzschild in dimension three or in higher dimensions as well now. Um, just a, a few comments about uh, what I uh, references. I may not be giving you references during my lecture. Uh, a lot of the references which belong to all these topics that I'm discussing. You can find them in my lecture notes. I don't know if they have been linked on the homepage of the conference. Have they not? Yeah. Do we have internet here? Can I just look up my homepage? Does this work? Can you Google my name? So, so that's how you're going to. Yeah, it's very good. Okay, C H R U S. Difficult to exercise. Yeah, almost good. Good. Okay, very good. Pietro Schill homepage. Good. So in Google, I have a coming up first. So now you go to publications. You go all the way down. So just uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I thought it was showing here. Uh, that's, that's not very productive. Can, can we do it again? <laughs> OK, good. So start again. Start it. Start, start, start. Go, Google me again. <laughs> go, go back. Go back. Yeah, go back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, <laughs> we don't want to. Good. Yeah. So this is the. Yeah, go back. OK. So Google me. Okay. You find home page there. Good. You click on it. Good. Then you go in publications, okay? You go in publications, yeah. you go all the way down. Yes. Keep going. Sorry, it's too long. <laughs> all the way? Yeah, all the way. It's just uh, you know, unpublished. Unpublished? Right? 
energy in general relativity, okay? So, there be there, so this one, you click here and uh, good. So the lectures here uh, will be a part of, the, of what's in here so you can find details of what I'm talking about and references and stuff like that. Good, thank you. Good, so uh, at this stage, uh, we know that there is something uh, useful. There is some interest in studying ADM energy because uh, it allows you to prove these things. That's at least so far. Uh, you have also, uh, there's a warning coming from, with uh, these energies because uh, physicists tend to think that if you have a positive energy theorem, then your system is stable and everything will be fine and uh, uh, you don't need to do anything more. You, you understand the world. This is actually wrong. Uh, so the ADM uh, positive energy theorem, I don't think it plays such a big role in the proof of stability of Minkowski space-time. You have to work much, much more to prove this. Uh, while uh, proof of global existence for, for this scalar field is just trivial based on this equation, right? So the energy can be useful, but doesn't have to. Uh, you have also to be careful, uh, there is a positive energy theorem for asymptotically hyperbolic space-time, so that's something that I'm going to talk about in my last lecture. And uh, so one has a positive energy theorem, things look swell, but uh, there is a famous uh, instability of anti-digital space-time uh, discovered by Bizon and Rostvorovsky, which show that no matter how small is a perturbation of uh, 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 asymptotically, your asymptotically anti space spacetime, it's going to generically uh, form a black hole. Right? So it's completely unstable, no matter how small your perturbation is, even though you have a nice uh, positive energy theorem. So positivity energy and stability are just uh, brothers, but uh, maybe very, very distant relatives uh, in some cases. Good, so this is so far for the introduction. Now, uh, let me now continue with something which is uh, uh, the simplest possible version of energy in general relativity. If you look at uh, post-Newtonian gravitational fields, <coughs> or even before, uh, if you look at uh, Newtonian and post-Newtonian fields. Right, and, uh, and ask again later. <laughs> uh, and post-Newtonian uh, right mass or mass. <laughs> Good. Well, so what's uh, Newton's theory of gravity? Well, you, if you're interested, uh, in a model perspective on this, there's a nice book by uh, Poisson and Will about this. Uh, well, part of it well, has, has a lot of information about this, but the simple, well, you just take a, a Newtonian potential. Uh, let's see, so I have to put some pi's and I have to put a g, which is the, uh, and I have to put a mu, so this is the Newton potential. Newtonian potential, and this is the thing which governs the equations of motion. Uh, so uh, I guess that would be d2 x over right uh, dt square is equal. Mm. Oh gosh, uh, it's probably with this convention. This is, this is my a nightmare point of all my lectures. When I'm talking about the Newtonian potential, uh, I've lectured a lot in France, and they use a different convention to the Newtonian potential as everybody else in the world. Uh, and so I never know which, like, which convention I'm going to use. Uh, so I think maybe it's some 
you as participant can help me with this. So uh, if I define the potential with this sign, then I have minus gradient or, or plus gradient. Right, so this is the ma mass which cancels out by the virtue of the, uh, of the uh, equivalence principle. Anyone can help me here? No? Plus minus, right? One, one of those works. So this is a Newton's constant, which is uh, obviously one. From now on, uh, this would be the mass density, which is, of course, uh, the energy density. And that's the, f the confusion starts coming in here, right? But so uh, that's the energy density, and there is a factor by c square, probably. And c is obviously 1. So this C will disappear in my equation. In other words, you can think of this as the energy density as well. Uh, good. And so, so that's Newton's gravity, right? You have a distribution of mass. You solve the Laplace equation. So this Laplacian is the usual one, d2 over dx squared plus d2 over dy squared plus d2 over dz squared. Good. And then you have a sign which is plus minus depending upon your convention there, but let me just choose this uh, uh, sign. So with this convention here, I think, and I hope, that phi will be uh, m over r rather than minus m over r. And that's why the, I think that the, the minus is the correct sign here. Uh, so with this convention, if uh, mu is zero outside a ball of radius r. Uh, so this is a ball of radius r, centered at the origin. Well, it doesn't really matter, but this is what it is. Then uh, phi will be equal to uh, m over r uh, for r larger than r, where m is the total mass. Right, so, so uh, what is this total mass? Then this is an integral of a R3 of, of mu, the mass density. But of course, because my mu is zero outside of the ball, it's actually the same as integral over ball over R of mu. But then I can use my equation here. Uh, I'm just wondering if I have my, my signs right at the end, but let's hope I will. So this is uh, integral of, uh, let's see. So g is 1, right? So we just don't want to worry that 4 pi is unfortunately not 1. So we need to divide by minus 1 over 4 pi. Uh, Laplace phi and use Stokes theorem to make it an integral over a sphere of radius r of the gradient of phi times dsi. Well, these are the surface forms if you want to think of this thing as uh, di phi times the normal, right? Times d2s. Well, this is a normal. Yes? Once again? Yeah, this, this is something is beyond me. <laughs> uh, 
should we take a vote? <laughs> Well, I, I've put a minus here, right? So the potential should be. <laughs> then now this is this sign is impossible. So, so you know, I, I <laughs> but I, let, let's agree we can leave with equations up to a sign, <laughs> or at least this equation. <laughs> yes. No. Right. That's low order terms. Sure. Thanks a lot. I'm happy to see that some students are not shy to to point out. Please do do uh, ask questions and point out mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. So so this is the uh, and of course. Uh, uh, Actually, already writing this is, I'm assuming, some boundary conditions because I could have uh, solutions of this equation which have wide behavior for large distances. Good. But so this is uh, asymptotically flat system. <laughs> Good. So I'm going to insist on this, this sign here uh, because I, I want a minus here. So the, the, the bottom line is that the mass is 1 over 4 pi with a minus integral of the gradient of phi at the boundary, right, times the DSI. That's what you do in, uh, in Newtonian gravity. And uh, by the way, here I've integrated over a sphere of radius r, but I can pass with the, uh, because the Laplacian of phi is zero outside of matter is the same as Lemus as r goes to infinity of this integral, so minus 1 over 4 pi rad i phi psi. And let me call this operation uh, of integrating of a sphere of radius r and going to infinity is an integral over a sphere at infinity. Okay. Maybe I'll put the index up or down depending my mood, but uh, upon my mood, but let me put it here. So df, df phi, dsi. Okay, so integral over a sphere of infinity actually means you take a sphere of a fixed radius and pass to the infinity. Right? And this uh, follows that this, this is the same as the limit follows either from the asymptotics or just from the fact that Laplace phi is zero for, for large distances. So, so this is my, my formula for mass. And uh, good. And I have a the positive energy theorem is trivial uh, here, right? I mean, this was equal of mu, integral of mu. So if mu is positive, then energy is positive, right? So mu positive m positive. And Actually, when it's zero, so let's go back this calculation, right? This is equal to the integral here. This is the integral Laplacian, but this is equal integral of mu. So if we started from zero, we have that this is zero, but if mu is positive and the whole integral is zero, then mu is zero, right? So you have, um, and m equals zero is only in vacuum, right? Only in vacuum. And of course, this is going to be wrong in some sense if you have black holes, but, uh, uh, and if you have relativity, then uh, that's going to be wrong, right? So the gravitational field has, has mass. Good. So this is uh, Newtonian gravity. What about uh, post Newtonian? Yes? Right, so that was my point here, right? That you can pass to the infinite. The question was, does this number depend upon the choice of the sphere? Uh, so, uh, well, I think that 
you can probably see it from here, right, that uh, if mu has, is zero outside of a large ball, uh, then it's also zero outside of a, larger, uh, of a larger ball, right? So I can do this calculation with any r uh, larger than, so maybe I should do this r1, where r1 is larger than r, right? If I do this calculation here, I'd get r1 here, right? So r1 here. So I get the same number no matter what the radius is, as long as it's larger than the support of, of mu. Okay? But thanks for pointing this out. Right? That's uh, actually the probably simplest way of seeing this. Right? So if we take any r1 larger than r, then integral r3 is the same as this because mu is 0 outside. Use the Stokes theorem on this, and you get the result no matter what r1 is. So, Passing to infinity is then again trivial right? because it does stop straight. Good. So let's go to uh, post Newtonian metrics. So, if you have some background in general relativity, you know how post Newtonian metrics look like. If you haven't, well, that's the formula. So, you just take a weak gravitational field gravitational field uh, and uh, small velocities. So you need both for this formula. Then you get the metric is uh, good, that's the difficult part. So again, this sign is going to show up here. Uh, I think it's minus 2 phi. I think that's correct. Thanks. <laughs> Good. And uh, there might be some G's uh, involved, right? So G is 1, and there might be some C's involved, and C is 1. So, so that's an approximate form for the metric. Very weak gravitational field, so if you assume that phi is very small. And its derivatives have to be very small, and second derivatives have to be small, and so forth, right? So, and not only this, but uh, the time derivatives have to be even smaller, right? Because I've also forgotten time derivatives. So, so this is a kind of an introductory GR uh, exercise. Uh, maybe at this stage I should tell you a little bit about my notation. Uh, So here, I understand there are physicists, there are mathematicians, and uh, have various uh, school of thinking. So vectors, uh, well, either, well, mu is for me typically uh, in 0 to n, and I'm not especially attached to three-dimensional space-times, but n is uh, always the space dimension, so you can if you like string theory, maybe your n is 10 or whatever your favorite number here. Uh, well, obviously, at this stage, I was in three dimensions for Newtonian gravity. Uh, so then the indices ij will be in uh, 1 to n. Uh, a vector for me is a differential operator. Uh, so if you don't like this notation, uh, then think of a collection of numbers. Okay? So a vector is an object which has several numbers, and I like to write this like that. This is just a, if you don't know what's the identification between vectors and differential operators, the, the important thing here is this coefficient. Okay? And so this is uh, in space time, and uh, uh, in most of my lectures, I will be in space. So this would be a vector. 
uh, scalar products, the mathematicians would write this, g of x, y. So a metric, two vectors, take the scalar product. If you are a physicist coming from the space time, you probably want to write something like that, where now, because the indices are repeated, they are summed over, right? So there's a, all, everywhere, summation convention. This is the same as saying x0 d0 plus x1 d1 plus xn dn. And uh, well, if you do it in space, then uh, you, you have a similar formula. This is for space time. And in space, uh, I will write, so say, GW, Z is GIJ, WI, ZJ. Same thing in index notation or something that mathematicians prefer. Uh, let me also write my convention for the Riemann tensor, which probably I will not really use because I will not do any many explicit calculations, but just to make sure. So the Riemann tensor is, uh, well, that's the formula I like. So x, y, z are vector fields. So if you are a mathematician, you've probably seen this one. And you're a physicist, you wonder what this means. But this means exactly the same thing as di dj zk minus dj di zk is equal r k l i j dl. OK? So that's probably what? Physicists are used to, and if you're a mathematician, you're wondering what this means. But these are the same equations. Okay? And uh, so that's my ordering of indices. Various people put indices in various orders. So that's uh, the one I use. And the Ricci tensor is the, so this is the Ricci tensor, uh, is the, this contraction. Then once you have the Ricci scalar, Ricci tensor, you just do the Ricci scalar. And you have noted that I'm using space indices here, but I might as well have used space time indices. I'd be mostly using space indices anyway in these lectures. But good. So these are my conventions. And so, so this, is, uh, yeah. this is my way of writing a metric, which means that this is G00 with the sign included. Or sometimes, I actually, I will write GTT so that it's clear that this is the p-coordinate, right? And this is uh, GIJ. Good. So now, uh, weak gravitational field, small velocities, phi satisfy exactly the same equation as before, uh, minus or plus, did I have a minus? Minus. Minus 4 pi actually rho, which is the energy density. But we said that this is the same as mu, right? So it's minus 4 pi mu. So this is the same equation. And therefore, the total mass is going to be the same, right? So that's, we know what the mass is. The mass is minus 1 over 4 pi integral of grad phi on the boundary at infinity, right? So times the normal. So good. So. Positive energy theorem as before. There's no issues here. Uh, and now, what is intriguing now is that phi appears both in the space part of the metric. So you can then read the mass from the space part of the metric. But you can also read the mass from the, so, and what's the right way? <laughs> is this the mass? Or is this the mass? Well, no, this metric doesn't matter, but this metric is very special. So if I take a modernal metric, can I just use this as a hint? So, so we will see that actually the right thing to do is to use this to obtain the ADM mass, which will be uh, 
essentially this formula in a more complicated way. And, but you can use this to define something called the Comor mass. However, the Comor mass is something which works well in stationary space times. Stationary space time. And there is a beautiful theorem of a colleague from Vienna, Bobby Bike, which says that for a stationary space time, these are equal. So if you happen to have a killing vector, stationary space time, you can measure the mass from this, or you can measure the mass from this. The formulas are not going to be as simple as, as this because this is a very special situation, but, uh, but they'll be equal. And this common mass business, which was already mentioned by, by my colleague before, uh, is actually needs this, right? So if you see Comor mass, you should say, well, careful, it has to be stationary, right? So sta Comor mass is only defined for, well, you can define it in general, but uh, uh, you want a killing vector uh, in there. And uh, while this ADM mass works in general for asymptotically flat systems. Good, so now uh, this is the simplest situation you can think of, Newton theory or post-Newtonian metrics. Uh, to continue, yes? Phi should be going to zero to infinity at some rate. And uh, the rate, well, if I have this equation, the rate is just coming from something called potential theory. One knows everything about solutions of Laplace equation which go to zero at infinity. So you don't have to think much. It just, Mr. Laplace tells you what it is. Actually, I think the, the first paper where I've seen a nice analysis of the asymptotic is here is probably a Murray, uh, a very old paper. To Rick, would you know where, how, how, how far back this goes, asymptotics of solutions of Laplace equation? Yeah, I think, so this, yeah, it's very classical, but yeah, so uh, it's in Murray in the 50s, or, but maybe before. Or, uh, anyway, so, so this is, you, you don't have much choice. Once you've given mu and say phi goes to zero, I don't have to tell you anything more. And, and, and my calculation for the mass uh, was just based on the equation, so I didn't really need to, to have the asymptotics. Uh, good. So, so we go to uh, the Cauchy problem in general relativity because this is going to be a key uh, to, uh, to set up the framework to, to understand what the mass is. So this is going to be a very short introduction to this. Usually I give uh, several lectures uh, on, just on this. Uh, again, you'll find uh, the information in the lecture notes. Well, on the same web page, there's uh, notes on the Cauchy problem. I want to try to download those. Uh, good. So, uh, so the question is, how do I construct solutions systematically? How to construct systematically? solutions of Einstein equations. Well, vacuum uh, and or otherwise. Uh, so the answer is uh, Cauchy problem. Well, one answer is, of course, that you just uh, start making various answers. So you open the exact solutions book like that with this group symmetry, this group of symmetry, try to solve them. Uh, we, uh, it was mentioned that if you just take axisymmetry, five functions, try to put it on maple, maple will crash. So it's not something that you can just, well, you don't do it reasonably by hand without uh, uh, a lot of thinking that even then you can't do it with computers. Uh, Without thinking, and uh, so so here, uh, this is the heart of mathematical general relativity. Mathematical general relativity is 
essentially about the Cauchy problem for Einstein equations, right? So uh, either you solve, you study evolution problems or you study initial data for those and uh, this is what mathematical GR is about. Uh, right, so Cauchy problem and this means what? So uh, give initial data at t equals zero and find a solution. of the equations, right? So give initial, well, I, I, I forgot to write data. That's the kind of things I often do in my lectures. So I say something, but I write something else. Data. <laughs> yeah, so somebody um, said about uh, Julius Schauder. Julius Schauder was one of the fathers of partial differential elliptic equations. That he was the worst lecturer ever. So he thought one thing, said another one, and wrote a third one. <laughs> so I'm trying to, to match. <laughs> uh, so um, yeah, initial data for find a solution. Uh, so, so, so the question is, well, what, does, what are initial data and what is t equals zero? Right? So in general relativity, you don't have t equals zero. Uh, so cosmologists are trying to tell us that the, we are living in a boring universe where there is a preferred time function. That's terrible. I think that this is going back to ether ideas and uh, 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 really the, the anti-general relativity as as much as you can, uh, but um, so if you're not doing cosmology, you don't have a cosmological time function, you don't have a preferred time. So uh, this uh, t equals zero is actually means any well, well behaved because uh, there is still some conditions to, to be put, but uh, uh, well behaved space like surface. And so we're going to call it sigma. And well-behaved is all only if you want to have some uniqueness properties. If you don't, then actually you don't care about well-behaved. You can just take any space like surface. And you have to get, give some data on this surface, right? So uh, and find a solution. What is the solution? Well, a solution uh, is not only a metric, but uh, you, you want a manifold, right? So you want a manifold M is uh, an interval times sigma. So somehow solutions of the Cauchy problem are boring as far as topology is concerned because uh, so I is an interval of time, right? So you have a, your initial data surface here and you construct a, a space time around it, right? So this is. Well, let me not try. So this is sigma, and your space time is a something around it. Yes? Uh -huh. Yes, I, I see. Uh, so, as I said, if you just want to talk about constructing solutions, anything works. Uh, I didn't tell you what the re remaining initial data are, so I, I, I will tell you in a second. If you want to uh, get uniqueness theorems and stuff like that, then you have to, to add maybe some conditions, right? right? So, uh, but uh, at this stage, anything is good. So, so what are the initial data? Well, uh, the equations are kind of... Uh, hyperbolic, so hyperbolic equations. This is not quite true. Uh, and actually, it's completely wrong if you just want to think about it as written here. 
certainly the, equation, the equations are second order, right? So equations second order. Well, what are the equations? So g mu nu is equal, say, zero in vacuum. Okay. Let me just put everything in here. I think 8 pi g over c, some power of c, some random power of c. Four, is it four? Four? Yeah, let's go for four, right? So this is the energy momentum tensor of matter. And this is uh, the Ricci tensor minus one half the Ricci scalar times the metric. And there will be in the, the, my last lecture, a cosmological constant. So lambda is a cosmological constant. Good. Uh, right. So, so the second order, obviously, because let's see. So, how, how does this work? Uh, so, the the Ricci is a contraction of Riemann, and the Riemann is uh, first derivative of the Christoffels plus the squares, but the Christoffels are d minus the inverse of the metric times the derivative of the metric plus gamma square, so you're going to get g minus 1 d to g plus times, right? So second order equations. And uh, there is a problem here. If you have a solution, g mu nu is a solution, and if y mu of x alpha, well, in a coordinates x, in coordinates x, uh, is any, any change of coordinate. Then, uh, well, you change the coordinate, you still get a solution because everything is tensorial, right? So g mu nu. Uh, d y, uh, well, it was in the next coordinate. So dx mu over d y alpha. Maybe you can't see here, right? Uh, then uh, g mu nu dx mu over dy alpha, dx nu over dy beta is also a solution. Good, fine. That's, on one hand, that's very good because uh, uh, the idea of general relativity was to have a theory which is coordinate invariant. So you have this here. But on the other, well, if you have well-posed evolution equations, well-posed means uniqueness. Right? So if you have a, uh, and uh, in fact, if you are familiar with uh, a little bit with theory of partial differential equations, you often use uniqueness to prove existence or things like that. These things go together, right? So uh, energy estimates are used to both prove uniqueness and existence. So if you have a set of equations which uh, don't have uniqueness, uh, that's already bad. And that certainly cannot be a wave equation or any, that cannot be an elliptic equation that cannot be an, a wave equation that cannot be a, a, a parabolic equation because these equations have uniqueness properties, right? So maybe globally there could be problems, but locally this, uh, these classes of equations, elliptic, hyperbolic, parabolic, have unique local solutions short in time and Hell might break, might break loose if you take large times, but for short times, everything works, right? So Einstein equations cannot belong as such, 
to any well-posed class. So there is a wonderful trick invented by Madame Yvonne Choquebrua, uh, which says, well, you have to fix coordinates. And there is one gauge condition uh, which works, is something called wave coordinates or harmonic coordinates or the Donder coordinates or something like that, right? So impose useful coordinate condition to get rid of this freedom. So let me show you one condition which is not useful. So bad idea is just to say, well, let's try to find coordinates where in which g looks like minus dt squared plus gij of x t dxi dxj. So we have second order equations. So initial data for this would be gig of x zero and dt over this, right? So second order equation, initial data, good, no way. I mean, there's no theorem which gives you existence in these coordinates in a direct way. So you can go around. I'm going to give you a good way of doing this. So you can do the following. You solve your problem in a good way and then change coordinates to get here. This works, which by the way tells us that there's something we don't understand about PDEs because if you can do it like that, then this means that you could do it directly somehow, right? But, but we can't. So that, that, this must be a mechanism so that you could work directly with this without doing these rounds. Uh, again, an interesting topic maybe for you to, to look at. Uh, there's one case in which it works, and this has been, uh, I think, Darmois is the first one to have seen this in the um, uh, long time ago. It's a Darmois, maybe in the 50s or something like that. If GIJ, uh, if the initial data are uh, real analytic, then you can use cauchy kovalevska to solve the problem. Uh, if G and uh, at zero, T equals zero, and DT at G equals zero is analytic, you can solve the problem. Solve using cauchy kovalevska But uh, cauchy kovalevska and analyticity, uh, well, these are suspicious theorems. For, for one, one never knows whether this is Kovalevska or Kovalevskaya, so that's already a hurdle here. Uh, anyone knows? I know that her name was Sophie, but uh, <laughs> anyway, and, and so maybe there's an I here or something like that. Uh, so what's the right way to do? Well. Uh, the right way to do uh, has been discovered by Yvonne Chakebrua. Uh, that's a lovely lady uh, who wrote a very nice book of memoir. Uh, you can find them in French, and I think they're being translated uh, to English now. And so then uh, she writes that she was, uh, uh, she, uh, uh, so her father was a professor at Ecole Normale in Paris. He was actually the director there. And she, know, she knew every mathematician from that time because they were all friends of his father. So Darmois was be one, part of the crowd of his uh, friends. And by that time, he actually, when she was um, in high school or something like that, uh, he, he proved the theorem and uh, somehow was discussing about this with her father, and she got interested in this. Then she uh, went to Lichnerovich, who was a PhD advisor, and he told her, well, why don't you study the constraint equations and things like that? So uh, Lichnerovich had a version of uh, understanding the constraint equation in general relativity. I'm going to tell you a little more about them shortly. Uh, why don't you try this? And that's going to be your thesis. And then, while well, she was she tried to do this, and uh, she met Loret, and he told her, "Well, you know, if you do this, it's going to be a little improvement of something that 
Dijnerovic already did, you should try a really hard problem. A really hard problem is the Cauchy problem for general relativity. So she tried, and she managed to do this. And the reason I'm telling you about this is because, uh, while well, you have uh, maybe some of your PhD students still, so don't go for the easy problem, go for the hard one, right? That's how you, I mean, her, her paper is a milestone. It just created mathematical GR as it is. And um, so don't go for the easy problems. Uh, do like Yvonne did. Anyway, so the good idea is, well, I probably won't need this now. So, uh, so, so to use uh, harmonic coordinates or wave coordinates, uh, wave coordinates, so good idea use, uh, let me put this in parentheses, generalized wave or harmonic And so, by the way, uh, next week, uh, Harvey Rial, I don't know if he's already here. Is Harvey here? No, maybe. We'll probably tell you a little more about this Cauchy problem. So, uh, so, this is going to be very sketchy. In any case, uh, you so uh, impose the condition impose box x mu equals zero. That's what she did. So, in other words, don't use any coordinates when trying to solve your equation, require that the coordinates satisfy the wave equation. So this, this is called harmonic because uh, if you replace the wave operator here by the Laplace equation, Laplace, then this would be harmonic coordinates. And so somehow people didn't make much distinctions originally between these, so this was called harmonic. Now this is the original harmonic uh, 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 the generalized one, so this is the original idea. But in fact, the modern way of doing this is actually to put here any functions which depend upon g, the derivative of g, and x. Okay? You can, uh, the existence theorems work either in this framework, this is what she did, but you can put any functions as long as they don't depend upon second derivatives here, right? So. That's the no d2g here. Good. So if you do that, then you get uh, an existence theorem. And the existence theorem is the following. Well, so first, then, uh, if you ask for, say, 1, then 1 plus Einstein equations are equivalent to an equation which looks like g mu nu, uh, mu nu d mu d nu g alpha beta is equal f alpha beta of g dg and x for some functions. which might be very complicated, but who cares? I mean, as far as if you're doing PDEs, you just say this is junk, it doesn't really matter. The important part is here. So this is really uh, clearly a wave operator. Right? So this is a wave operator acting on the metric. The funny uh, wave operator, don't try to put something like that, g mu nu d mu d nu g alpha beta, which would be covariant. That would be, of course, completely useless because covariant derivative of the metric is zero. <laughs> so, so, so this is a, a bad idea to try to do this. So you really need this breaking of covariance by introducing some coordinates here. And that's the equations you get, right? So you get a wave operator acting on the coefficient. These are some lower order terms. So yes? Right. So this box here, very yes. Thanks. So this box is actually right. So written like that, uh, well, written like here, this box would be 1 over square root that g, d mu 
d alpha, g alpha beta, d beta acting on whatever it wants to act, right? So this is, uh, uh, oops, and there's a determinant missing. So this is this box here. This one is a bit similar. Differs by some lower order terms or something like that, right? So this is a scalar, scalar wave operator. Uh, here is a funny one. It's really uh, in coordinates, right? So, so it's, it's uh, yeah. obviously not coordinate invariant, but it's meant not to be coordinate invariant. Good. So, so then. Uh, you solve, yes, five minutes. Okay, now I've put my timer on, so I'm just going to check. Yeah, I think four <laughs> is what's left. Five minutes, 20 seconds. <laughs> Good, so you look at that and you think, no, this cannot be correct. Because now I have well-posed wave equations. I can solve them. I have unique solutions. Uh, but uh, what guarantees that these conditions will be satisfied? Uh -huh. So problem. What guarantees that the solution of so that the solution of two good and the answer is the constraint equations okay so the argument that proves this is long one and I don't have time to do this but the answer is constraint equations and I'm not going to write them down that's going to be my lecture this afternoon. So uh, the constraint equations. So there is a miracle, again discovered by Ivan Shokebura, uh, which says that if the constraints are satisfied and if you have a solution of these equations, then this will also hold and you'll get a solution of the Einstein equation. So this is a complicated argument uh, which uh, deserves a good PhD thesis. And uh, so I stop here. Thank you.